Abstract algebra, occasionally called modern algebra, is the study of various algebraic structures called groups, rings, and fields. The beauty and symmetry of abstract algebra is often demonstrated with the permutations of a Rubik's cube. While beautiful and thought of as complex, group theory and some underlying principles will be presented in this video series in a rather non-rigorous way, leaving proofs and hard math to another set of videos. For now, we hope to just provide you with a quick view into solving group theory. So let's examine the basic building blocks of a group. To do that, we will start with something very familiar, the integers. Our first requirement is the group must contain a set of elements, and the integers certainly form a good set, as seen in this basic number line. This set of elements, our group, must have four specific properties. The first is a mathematical operation that, when performed on any two elements of our group, gives us another element in that group. For our integers, we know that addition is such an operation. We add any two integers together, and the answer is still an integer. 3 add 4 is 7. Subtraction is simply adding a negative integer. 4 minus 3 is 1. And this is true no matter how big of an integer we add together, as far as our number line will go. When an operation has this property, we simply call it a binary operation, and we say that the integers are closed under the binary operation, in this case of addition. The next property our group must have is associativity, something we probably all remember from elementary school. Associativity means the operation can be performed on elements by grouping them in different ways. As an example, let's use some specific integers and see the results. From the left side of the equation, inside the parentheses, we add 1 plus 2 and get 3. We then add the resulting 3 plus 4 and get 7. On the right side, we perform the addition inside the parentheses first, 2 plus 4 is 6, and then we add the 1, again getting a total of 7. The associative property must hold true for any three elements in our group. The next property is a very simple one. There must be an identity element in our set. An identity element is one that when we use it in our operation leaves the other elements unchanged. We know in the integers 0 is such an element. 4 plus 0 is still 4. 0 plus a negative 6 is still a negative 6. And this property must be true when the identity element is used in any order. We will talk a bit more on the importance of the order of operations later. The final property we need is that there must be an inverse for every element. Something when we perform our operation on an element and its inverse returns the identity. 4 plus a negative 4 under addition is 0, the identity element. Negative 6 plus 6 is also 0. And in the integers, we have an inverse for every element. Again, order is important. Notice that the inverse element works when added on the left or the right side of the element. And those are the properties we need to have a group. We need a set of elements. We need a binary operation, one that only returns other elements within the group, one that is closed. We need the associative property to hold for all elements. We need an identity element that works on both the left and right side of all elements. And we need an inverse element for all elements in the group. Again, works on both right and left sides. Now, I had mentioned that we would talk about the order of operation, so let's look at another familiar property of the integers. We know that 3 added to 6 is 9, but we also get the same if the order is reversed. 6 plus 3 is 9. This is the commutative property. We say the group is commutative, or we call it abelian. This is not a required property for a group. This just happens to be an extra bonus with the integers under the operation of addition. Again, the properties we need to have a group are a set of elements, a binary operation with closure, the associative property holds, there is an identity element, and there is an inverse element. And that is all that we need to form the algebraic structure we call a group. Now that we have an idea of the required properties for a set of elements to be a group, and we know the integers form a group under the operation of addition, such as 3 plus 4 is 7. Let's take another look at a familiar group we use every day. Let's take this number line and let's select a few, rather a finite number of integers, say 12 of them, 0 through 11. And rather than a straight line, what if we now arrange these elements in a different, more familiar way? That is a circular line, and the elements become hours, just like we have hours on a clock face. We see we still meet our first criteria. We have a set of elements, but what can we use for an operation? Again, let's choose the simple operation of addition. 2 plus 6 equals 8. 
And because this is similar to a clock, we know we use modulo addition. We see that 10 plus 4 simply carries us around the clock and gives us 2. Just like our integers, we see that the binary operation of addition, that is addition modulo 12, works. Our next property is associativity. And for this, we'll use the same example from our number line. On the left side of the equation, inside the parentheses, 1 plus 2 is 3. And then we see 3 plus 4 is 7. On the right side of the equation, again, 2 plus 4 is 6. And 1 plus 6 is also 7. Remember, this is not a rigorous proof, but we see intuitively that the associative property holds for all the elements in our set. For our group, we must have an identity element. That is an element that doesn't change other elements under our operation of addition when added on either side. Like the integers, for modulo addition, that element is 0. 0 plus 7 is 7. When added on the other side, 5 plus 0 is 5. So our set under addition has the identity element. The last thing we need for this to be a group is an inverse element. Remember, when performing our operation on an element and its inverse, that gives us the identity element. So again, this is the element when added to a specific element gives us 0. 4 plus 8 is 0. 4 is the inverse of 8. 8 is the inverse of 4. 7 plus 5 is 0. 7 is the inverse of 5. And 5 is the inverse of 7. Again, intuitively, we see that all the elements of our group have an inverse. We have seen that the integers form a group with an infinite number of elements. And now, using our clock as an example, we can form a group with a finite set of elements. We simply chose 12 due to our familiarity with the clock, but we could have chosen any number. A 24-hour clock, if you will. Or, how about 360 degrees in a circle? In fact, we could even use a continuous real number line, a subject we will cover in later videos. Or we could choose a fewer numbers to simplify our group and help us get a better understanding of how these structures work. We could choose six elements, or we could even choose three. But how would we look at a group of three elements? And what is it that makes group theory so beautiful and fascinating? Remember the Rubik's Cube? It's the symmetry. So using our knowledge of geometry, let's make these points the vertices of an equilateral triangle. The symmetry is that we can rotate this triangle 120 degrees in either direction or even reflect the triangle across three different axes, and we still have a triangle indistinguishable from the original. To be able to follow these rotations and reflections, let's highlight the vertices red, green, and blue, and then let's show how these elements or motions of the triangle form a group, a group that we call D6. So, our set of elements are all of the rotations or reflections we can perform on this triangle, and if it wasn't for our markers, still have the triangle appear as though it was in the same original position. The first element would be the identity element. Remember the identity element does not change any other element when used in the operation. So the identity element is simply do nothing. We will call that E. The second element will be a rotation of the triangle 120 degrees clockwise. Let's call that alpha. The third element will be another 120 degree rotation, as if we had rotated the original triangle 240 degrees clockwise. Since that is the same as doing 120 degree rotation twice, Let's call that element alpha squared. If we were to rotate the triangle 360 degrees clockwise, it would be back in its original position. So that would really be the same as the identity element, which we already have. Notice if we were to rotate the triangle counterclockwise, we would end up in the same position as if we had rotated the triangle an alpha or alpha squared. So alpha and alpha squared are all of the rotation elements. Now let's look at the reflections. We can draw an axis through the top vertex and the midpoint of the bottom line, a vertical or 90 degree axis. We can also draw from the lower left vertex to the upper right line at a 30 degree axis, and from the lower right vertex to the upper left at a 150 degree axis. So our fourth element would be if we reflect the triangle across the vertical or 90 degree axis. Let's call that sigma, and if we were to do a sigma again, that puts us back at the identity. The fifth element will be this if we reflect the triangle across the 30 degree axis. Let's call that mu. And just like sigma, if we do a second mu, it would put us back at the identity. The sixth element will be if we reflect the triangle across the 150 degree axis. Let's call that tau. And just like sigma or mu, if we were to do a second tau, it would put us back at the identity. And those six elements, the motions of symmetry of the triangle, are the elements we'll check to see if they are a group. So with this set, let's look for a binary operation. Just like the composition of functions, let's use the composition operation, or adding the motions together. 
Remember, the order of operations when doing the composition of function matters, so we will perform the function on the right, then follow that with the function on the left. Our first example will be alpha followed by sigma. Alpha, the rotation of 120 degrees, followed by sigma, the reflection about the 90 degree axis. We see that the resulting position of the triangle is an element of our group, the element tau. Putting the triangle back in the identity, let's see what we get if we reverse the order. Sigma, the reflection about 90 degree axis, followed by alpha, the rotation of 120 degrees. And since this group is non-commutative or non-abelian, order matters. The resultant position of the triangle is now mu. And doing another mu puts us back to the original identity. So we have our operation, the composition of functions or adding the elements. Now let's check associativity. The left side in the parentheses is a tau followed by alpha, which gives us a sigma. And then the equation is sigma followed by another sigma, which is the identity. The parentheses on the right is sigma followed by tau, which gives us an alpha squared. And the equation is then alpha squared followed by alpha, which is also the identity. And so in this example, the associative property holds. Again, this is not a rigorous proof. However, this property does hold for all elements. For the identity element, that is simply the do-nothing element, and that will work when added to the left or right side of another motion. For the inverse, we see that any reflection about an axis is the inverse of themselves. And again, it doesn't matter if it's done on the right or the left. And we see that for the rotations alpha and alpha square, when those are combined, they're the inverse of each other. So all elements have an inverse. And with that, a set of six elements of motion of the symmetry of a triangle under the binary operation, the composition or adding of motions, we see that the associative property holds, that there is an identity element, and that all elements have an inverse. Therefore, D6 is a group. Remember, for some groups, those that are non-abelian order matters, such as alpha followed by tau followed by sigma, which is the same as alpha squared. That is not the same as tau followed by alpha followed by sigma. That is the identity. So order matters in non-abelian groups. In this video, we covered the group of integers under the binary operation of addition. And we saw that group was associative, the group contained an identity element, namely zero, and that every integer had an inverse, namely its negative. We also saw the group of integers modulo 12. Our clock was also a group because of the binary operation of addition, the group met the requirements of associativity, an identity element, and inverse elements for all elements. And that there was nothing special about just using 12 elements. We could have used 24 elements, 360 elements, or another infinite group by using a continuous line. And finally, we explored D6, the symmetrical group of the triangle. In our next video, we will explore a bit more about the D6 group and the symmetry of a triangle. We will also introduce the group of permutations, such as those in the Rubik's Cube. We will look at some of the simple properties of these groups and how relationships between groups are made. To be made aware of when the next video is published, please subscribe to the Group Garage channel. And if you like the videos, please leave a like down below. If there are any comments or questions or topics you'd like to discuss in these videos, please fill out those in the comments below. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video and see you in the next video in the Group Garage.